probably the very reason I'm sitting with you here today as a chemistry teacher, not any other science, but chemistry, is due to the fact that chemistry came to me most easily as a very visual learner. Chemistry is full of models. The whole half a year is about understanding the atom. This object that exists at a scale we cannot ever see or dissect or measure directly. If you're a biology teacher, you do have the opportunity to get your students to actually dig into some living things. If you teach physics, you're able to take objects and arrange them in a way where you can measure motion, you can observe motion, qualitative, quantitative going on there. But in chemistry, we're very limited to models. And so much of our basic understanding, our basic reasoning comes from those early scientists who developed and proposed these specific models. So in this video I'm bringing you today, I am sharing all about my lesson, the, the very lesson I present to my own students on Schrodinger's model of the atom, filling orbital diagrams, and writing electron configurations. All of those three ideas, very, very model driven. And bringing it to you in a way you'll see that is also technology based, where I was able to build a complete lesson challenging students on multiple fronts using only a free, very accessible web simulation. One that allows a great deal of trial and error, which is inherent to inquiry and discovery-based learning, and one which also calls upon them to really do that evidence identification, constantly encouraging students to argue from evidence. So if you're here because you are also a high school chemistry teacher looking to make this topic more active, more student-centered for your classroom, give them the reins in learning, this is perfect for you. You can know that I also do sell this lesson in my Teachers Pay Teacher store. If you are another science teacher, don't close out right now. You teach biology, you teach physics, you teach earth science, or even a middle school science. You're gonna learn something here about the structure of a lesson a lab in every lesson, one where students are digging in, but every day you can give them this opportunity and still provide the full, almost like a 5E style of lesson. If you're new here, we haven't met before. My name's Lisa and I am behind lab in every lesson. I've been teaching for 15 years online for a cyber charter school. And obviously there, we did not have access. We didn't have a mobile lab. We did not ship students uh, materials to do traditional wet labs. So what I really had to do to be the science teacher I wanted to be, the one that made me happy to get up and go to work every day, was to push beyond the obvious obstacle that existed there and to get my students to practice science through doing despite not having their hands on traditional lab equipment. And what I was able to do was, unknowing to me, incorporate the science and engineering practices that are listed in the NJSS, get students to think through those cross-cutting concepts, and get to the core ideas. Ultimately coming out with this framework for building an inquiry-based lesson and still accomplishing my full curriculum in a full year's time. Now this particular lesson I'm talking about today, I want you to be aware that it is the third lesson in my series all about electrons that is leading to an understanding, forming a foundation for an understanding for chemical bonding and then chemical reactivity. So the exact standard we're working with today is the one that pertains to structure and properties of matter in the NGSS. And it reads, using the periodic table as a model to predict the relative properties of elements based on the patterns of electrons in the outermost energy level of atoms. So at this point, my students have undergone or been part of two lessons, a basic Bohr model lesson, where they learned about the location, the energy, the behavior of electrons in those simple circular style orbitals, and then the periodic trend relating to atomic radius. So going into the Schrodinger model of the atom, they're familiar with distance from the nucleus, and they're also familiar with the idea that electrons don't spin around in that pretty little circle, but in fact, they are jumping all over the place all the time. We're also reinforcing another lesson of mine, which 
<laughs> pertains to the history of atom the atomic timeline, really. The science scientists who contributed to these models and following them through the progression, of course, after Bohr would, uh, in terms of organizing the electrons, would come Schrodinger. And so that might be an important piece here. What I'm going to talk about next are those specific science and engineering practices, those specific cross-cutting concepts that I want you to look for in the lesson that I'm about to show you. And I want you to know that you can download this very spreadsheet for your own work, uh, for your own reference. And it also includes direct links to all of these lessons. So that might be helpful. Check the description below for the links on that. What I'm showing you here in this snapshot is exactly which science and engineering practices I believe this lesson includes. And so we're talking Schrodinger's model of the atom. You'll notice here that I actually do have a day two on this and I do treat it as a completely separate lesson. The first lesson is more of an introduction to what Schrodinger's model looks like and what the orbital diagram is and how it gets built. The second series of lessons or the second series of days is intended to connect it to that periodic table. So in so much as our standard is about the behavior of those outermost electrons we're getting that in this in this lesson the arrangement and then in the second series we're really talking about its connection to periodic trend so that's to come stay tuned for that video next here uh as i said in my intro this lesson perhaps more than all of them in the series really, really goes to developing using models. And at this point, students are very familiar with the Bohr model, so we're able to extend that. But again, here you'll see they don't just use a model that I'm providing them, they are actually gonna build one. And the key to making it a discovery-based learning opportunity, inquiry-based, is to not give them a whole lot of direction to begin with. The resource that I use is very, very dynamic, very, um, it's wonderful, quite frankly, because as students make, make decisions and take action, the program gives them automatic feedback as to if it's correct, if it's not correct, and even little hints as to why. So the trial and error can be very frustrating to some students if they aren't used to it, um, but it is the sort of challenge we want to present them with each and every day to get that more how to think about things and think through things, that critical thinking aspect, rather than just the what is it? You know, what is the content? Regurgitate it back. In so doing, whenever they're developing a model of any kind, they are naturally obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information. In this lesson, there in every one of my lessons, there is an artifact outline that um, that I have students complete. It helps me measure their engagement and their progress toward understanding, but also allows them to participate in the process of science, which is to make those observations, to record them, and to use them as evidence in the future. And of course, then you'll see actually in this entire spreadsheet here, engaging an argument from evidence comes through in every single one of my lessons because that's science. We observe and explore, we document so that we can use those observations as evidence to support our findings, whatever they are. Now, in terms of cross-cutting concepts, this lesson is called upon by formally by the NGSS to call out patterns. And certainly, once you know how to do an electron configuration or fill an orbital diagram, you realize it's very patterned. It's very repetitious. You follow a set of guidelines and rules. Absolutely. We also find the electron configurations mapped to the periodic table, and the periodic table is nothing but patterns. So absolutely, this comes through. But I would challenge, and, and sometimes because of this question, the authors of the NGSS, uh, because I find them so limiting. Certainly, if you prepare a lesson in a, in a specific way, you can maybe slant to any of these cross-cutting concepts. I think it's a shame to not definitely highlight system and system models here. 
because that is in fact what we're talking about. The components of, of, of a system, which in our case are electrons, and the interdependence of them and uh, the outcomes that are produced because of that model. You know, the implications of our orbital diagrams, our electron configurations are read right there in the standards that we get relative properties of elements from them, from this unique design that has been created and that we have that we have witnessed, that we have known to be true. So those two things you should expect to see shining through in this lesson. Now I will show you this lesson in just a moment, but I do wanna also set up some more expectations for what you're gonna see here. And this certainly speaks to those of you, especially who are watching, so that you can learn more about lesson planning like this for yourself. You're going to see a lesson that includes five main parts of a general framework that all of my lessons follow. The first is to include a very strategic warm-up activity. Not a crossword puzzle, not a word find, but actually either relevant practice or a prompt that will allow students to connect prior knowledge, academic or experience-based, to what is going to be presented in the lesson. So I call it review and preview because whatever they're going to do is also going to stretch them toward and get them ready for what's to come. Then I also include very clear and detailed lesson objectives as learning intentions and success criteria. Now this is promoted by John Hattie in his series on visible learning where the learning intentions really uh, explain why we're doing what we're doing and really should then speak and connect to the standard in, in, some, in some way that we're looking for patterns, that we're looking for relative properties, that we're looking at patterns of electrons in this case. Uh, whereas success criteria are going to be part of that student-centered system, the success criteria are going to allow your students to measure their own progress, to know where they are, and sometimes, honestly, when I don't finish a lesson, we're able to say exactly where we stopped and pick up the next day. Um, but they're going to include a range of activity-based success criteria. So what we're thinking of as student engagement in the day, what have they been able to accomplish on that and, and how masterful have they been on the spectrum of mastery versus not mastery or approaching mastery and assessment based success criteria. Because in chemistry, we probably can have a test at the end, regardless of whether you're working in GSS or not, if you're preparing your students for a college level chemistry class, certainly they're gonna have some measure of a standardized test system in there. And there's things that they need to be able to do there. For example, here they need to be able to write, read and write electron configurations. It's our love language in chemistry, in high school chemistry, right? Read and write an orbital diagram. Then we have an observation activity, and that's the thing that really shines through. I call it an observation activity with task instructions because it can, the language we use matters. That's what it comes down to. The language we use with students matters, and if it feels too big, that's when you get them to shut down and engagement dies on arrival. <laughs> But if we say, just use your eyes, just use your senses, tell me what you see, then it's a little bit lower stakes. Following, however, following, of course, the observation piece has to come some evidence-based analysis, data-based analysis, data-dependent analysis. In ELA circles these days, we've got heavy text-dependent analysis. I'm saying in science, we should be reading data and we should be pulling it from our observations. And this portion can be either heavily guided from you or uh, depending on the level of your student, maybe you let them take the reins with that also. And that comes in part with a really strategically developed artifact outline. At the end of every lesson, we're hitting on some skill practice. Those are your assessment-based success criteria. They mimic what your students are gonna see in a quiz, on a test, to be sure that the experience you're providing them is transferring into like academic mastery, whatever form 
that presents itself as. And so you're gonna see all of those components in this lesson, I'm absolutely sure of it. Let's get to looking at that lesson now. I'm gonna start here with the review and preview because this is what my students enter class doing each day. I actually give them the review and preview, the warm up before they even see the learning intentions for the day. Uh, because again, it's supposed to connect the day before. And one of the ways this was started to be integrated for me was that in our cyber school, you know, part of our foundation is the flexibility that that it offers. And so oftentimes students aren't completing tests on the same day or homeworks on the same day. And so I can't really go over those assessments with students. I in fact don't. Because if I do, I have to wait weeks and weeks to accommodate all the IEPs and different things we have happening there. Uh, so what I've become very accustomed to is making sure we are spiraling back on the former lessons regular. And in so much as I shared that atomic radius as a periodic trend is presented before this, we are reviewing um, atomic size here. Now that does come into play because eventually we want to connect students to this idea that whether S, P, or D, the number that comes before the letter in our configurations and our orbital diagrams does still measure distance. And that's where we get that connection piece there. But giving them here eight different opportunities to compare elements, we have a series that is comparing elements within a group and then a small series comparing elements within a period because those two have very different uh, trend like arrows that we would draw on the periodic table and then just shaking it up different period and um, different period and group number which is bigger in that atomic radius periodic trend lesson we went in great depth about evidence and reasoning to support those not merely drawing arrows on the board so again shout out to check out that video if you're curious about that this is a great way to start class and it can take only five minutes if you approach it and just asking them to do it. You could even, if you're in a face-to-face -face classroom, I'm sure most of you are, you can just simply hand this out, have, have a place for students to pick this up on the way into class, get right to it. And as soon as you can um, get to reviewing them and you could go through all the answers, you could have students offer their answers, you can have it prepped somewhere for a couple volunteers to uh, share their responses and it's done, five to 10 minutes. And then we're moving on to these specific learning intentions and success criteria. I do really like to point out my today statement. Um, in these former lessons, specifically in atomic radius, I was saying today I am learning how to compare atom sizes. Well, today I am using in this lesson, a learning intention that reads today I am learning about Learning about makes it almost sound like I'm just going to passively take in this information. And that's not at all what the lesson is structured as. However, this is an introductory based lesson. They're going to be exploring. So in so much as they're learning about, yes, <laughs> it kind of all starts there. We're sort of taking in the basics and then we're going to do something with it. We're gonna learn about the details of Schrodinger's atomic model so we can talk like a scientist. Such an important learning intention for every lesson in chemistry because disciplinary literacy is real here. I tell my students that learning chemistry is like learning a different language. We eventually speak in all symbols and letters and numbers and uh, that's not how English is. <laughs> I mean, it's a combination, right? We have to understand what we're looking at in order to read it and write it and speak about it. But moreover, a very focused learning intention here, which really does connect us back to that standard, is to use patterns more specific to more specifically predict and describe location and energy of electrons. See, the key there is to more specifically, because my students have already at this point described location and energy of electrons in the Bohr model, but Schrodinger ups the ante with his degree of specificity and to more accurately predict chemical properties of various atoms. That piece comes later, but it's still okay to be a learning intention. This is a step that gets us to another place down the line. In so much as what they will be able to do, yes, there are many tasks. 
I'll be able to use the terms Aufbau diagram and electron configuration correctly in context, and that ties directly back to our talk like a scientist. A lot of our success criteria and learning intentions should complement each other. Uh, we're going to fill Aufbau diagrams for three atoms using a simulation for guidance or an interactive tool. And with each of those, I do want them to write electron configurations also using just an example. But in using that web tool and in the trial and error of it, actually to extract the guidelines they felt that they used for us to go on and do more of these without visual aids. So it's the trial and error, it's the learning through doing, it's the observing what I was able to do versus what I was not able to do, and then applying that in the future with the ultimate goal to be to use the guidelines and be able to fill orbital diagrams, write electron configurations for at least the first 20 elements on the periodic table. In high school chemistry, we are pretty much limited to our main group elements. We're not diving into those transition metal elements. Included in this lesson is a nod to that timeline of scientists. This is a snapshot of what is part of my scientists of atomic history or atomic timeline scientists lesson where students actually take snapshots from a video and arrange the descriptions, the names on a pre-established timeline. But just pointing out here that Schrodinger relied more heavily on math to make his predictions than anything else. We have additional word wall pieces here, including the significance of valence electrons, which we're going to eventually tie back to in a big way, especially when determining periodic trend for electron configurations, that periodic trend that we saw from teaching atomic radius. And again, the atomic radius, because in teaching this, I will actually superimpose a drawing of the nucleus and those simple Bohr model um, arches, if you will, to, to represent different orbitals and distance from the nucleus. Here we have a word wall that defines off-bow diagram and electron configuration, really portraying to students that the orbital diagram is like a map, that we can actually look at it and see where the electrons live, and the electron configuration is more of an address. So if we're doing Google Earth and we're looking at our house in Google Earth, in my house you would see a house and a couple of houses, but a whole lot of farmland. <laughs> and if you want to mail me something, I have a specific street number and street name in a specific state with a specific zip code. And so do all the electrons. And so we introduce it that way. You may or may not have ever seen it portrayed in this upside down version. I do need to include this, include this in my lessons because my curriculum provider for our school does portray it this way, though I had never seen it this way. Um, by upside down, I mean starting at the 1S at the top and moving down. But I have seen images online, especially that portray some diagonal arrows indicating how students, the order that they should fill these orbital diagrams. So perhaps you have seen that. I like to include it just to be thorough. But I typically do use the one in the top right corner here where energy naturally as it's increasing moves up and our boxes go one, two, three, four up instead of down. Also showing the electron configuration. So you can think of this like a mini lecture, mini lesson. I do not spend more than five minutes here. Absolutely not. You can very easily get sucked in when you are a lecture based teacher leaning heavily all the time on transferring your knowledge and just talking at your students and showing them examples and doing it all for them to get sucked into doing it all right here. But rather the key to this lesson, it's success in the critical thinking aspect is to just say, these are the terms. These are the names of the things you're going to be using and doing and what you're going to see in the simulation. Very basically, this is what they are. And oh, and also at this point, me and my students were playing in electrically neutral territory because a few lessons down from this, we're going to launch into octet rule and how or why electrons would lose electrons using Bohr model, using um, orbital diagrams, box diagrams, using electron configurations as evidence for which electrons would come and go. So this is very important also at this point in time. Okay, sharing you my task instructions here. This has to be 
blurried out for copyright purposes. What is wonderful, amazing about the internet is you can find amazing free materials there. You do not need a subscription to an expensive or even not so expensive platform for your students to do experimentation. Now, I'm not knocking them, they're fantastic too, but honestly, my school, since I have written my ent entire curriculum, my school has paid for some of those programs. We've been in a pilot mode, we've been in a paid mode, and I just have not flexed into them because I fear that they will go bye-bye next week <laughs> or next year. And I don't want a curriculum full of lessons contingent upon a paid resource if I'm not willing to pay that bill, which is not to say I'm not willing to pay the bill uh, because I do pay for book widgets, which is the digital worksheet that comes with all of my lessons. Uh, but I, I see huge benefit in that. My school won't pay for it, so I do it. Side note, this has to be blurred out, but I have included the link in the description below. Check it out as we talk through if you want to. Basically what's happening here um, is that Students are provided the shapes of orbitals 1s through 3p, and each of the p orbitals is shown as a different axis. So 3px, 3py, 3pz, and students need to build four atoms. They need to build four Schrodinger atoms and dragging and dropping them into a, a, an empty space. Again, trial and error will tell them which ones to start with, which ones to do next. Uh, and the repetition of requiring four atoms increasing slowly to the biggest one will cement it for them. And, you know, we could do that with just the orbital box diagrams, too by showing them ourselves and then giving them that drill practice. But the unique thing here is it shows them the actual three-dimensional depiction of Schrodinger's atom alongside a potential uh, box diagram. Now, as you're filling the actual orbitals, the model orbitals with electrons, arrows are popping up in the box diagram right next to it. The only flaw I see, the only thing I would love for this publisher to do differently is to label those boxes S's and P's, because that is something I have to intervene with when I'm teaching this. Also, when I give task instructions, though I do not demonstrate the process for students, I do annotate the picture a little bit um, to, to make sure that they have, you know, specifically what they should press and how they should do. Now with this simulation, I do go through helium with them. It's only two electrons. Um, but then they increase and they increase to carbon, sodium, and argon. Now, this is what I call an artifact outline. This is part of our observation activity. And again, it's low stakes, looks intimidating maybe for a student, but when they realize all I have to do is copy what I see in this box diagram popping up as arrows onto my worksheet, the most challenging part is the trial and error of getting it right. And so it's a little less heavy for them. And what my students usually will do and what I encourage them to do is just do the box diagrams at first because that's all the simulation is providing them is the arrows in the box diagram. They will need to refer back to, and I will project this on the screen while, we're, while I'm teaching, while they're working, they will need to refer to a, an electron configuration model to prepare an electron configuration for themselves from this activity. So that would be like stage two. Now write the electron configurations. And ultimately, from the doing, and this is so important because if you had just shown students how to fill these box diagrams, you would be answering for them, what do the numbers indicate? What do the letters mean? Uh, you have to tell them all that. How many electrons can be in a single box? But because they are doing it themselves, because they're taking in this information, they can answer these questions. That the numbers in the orbitals mean distance from the nucleus, the size of the atom. Because the letters in the orbital tell us shape, spherical versus this weird OP dumbbell looking thing. And how many, how many electrons per box? They are directly getting that 
and they're doing it at the same time. So we're mastering core idea, we're mastering science practice, developing and using models. Developing models is the key here. It's something that's very challenging to create for a student as an experience without some kind of assistance like this. And then a big space for students to say, hey, there are three rules to doing this, three guidelines. What do you think they are? And you will be just astounded with how your students can teach you what you are trying to teach them. That's the goal. Uncovering core ideas. Not to show up in, in class and say, okay folks, today we are covering orbital diagrams and electron configurations. No, the idea is you are going to uncover it through the doing. That's discovery-based learning, that's constructivism, that's inquiry-based learning in action. Included in this lesson is actually also a nod to some amazing automated adaptive practice used by another publisher online, completely free. Given a shout out there, I can't use their name though. Um, now, when students return from this activity, as a matter of, you know, where is the data dependent analysis? Where's the evidence based analysis? Usually what I'm doing as the teacher to facilitate this part is to show student work or to have students in real time show this when they're done and for us to discuss, to open it up to everyone. What do the numbers mean? What do the letters mean? Now I do actually sometimes, and this is to also use, also uh, to make that formative assessment shine through and still accomplish this goal. I might include it as, po as polling, as just I'm asking the question, they're giving the answer. And so that is how this particular lesson is structured where I'm taking snapshots of the completed part of the activity. Again, it's blurred out here for the benefit of legal reasons. <laughs> Don't want to give away what I shouldn't be giving away, but the link is in the description below. Um, how the box diagrams were built, what the model of the atom looks like, and what the electron configuration should be. It's almost like saying, now here's your answer key, check yourself. Even though, of course, as a teacher, you're circulating in the room, your eyes over the shoulder, you're redirecting as necessary. What do the numbers in the orbital labels indicate? And these QR codes there for my purpose in delivering this lesson, not yours. Uh, what do the letters in the orbital labels indicate? And with every one of these questions, we can follow up, what's the evidence? How do you know? We don't have to just leave it. This is what the numbers mean. This is what the orbitals mean because the evidence is right before us. And that's how we constantly reaffirm the usefulness of evidence and get students into the habit uh, and the routine of citing evidence. At this point, I will reveal those rules. Usually I'll take a look first and have students chime in on what they have found. Sometimes they are spot on. Um, but not always. And I think that's going to depend on your level of student, your level of engagement. But of course, this is where we're introducing the Offbell rule, the Paul exclusion principle and Hun's rule. It all should come totally clearly through them because as you, well, you can't see, but in these examples of carbon, sodium and argon, there's enough electrons to go beyond the 2s and start having the opportunity to fill the 2p or partially fill the 2p and make sure even the Hun's rule shines through. This is also a great bit of notes for students to refer to. And then to tie up this lesson as an introduction lesson, not an application based lesson, the skill practice is simply how many electrons in every box, in every orbital. So this might be a question that shows up like as a standardized on your test or a test somewhere. I'm sure it was probably on my praxis exam to become a teacher. I don't remember back that far, but I think probably. What's the maximum number of electrons that can occupy any single box? And once we know this for sure, just looking at them there, it's right before our eyes, there's two. Well, how many in an S orbital? Only two. How many in a P orbital? Oh wow, there's three boxes to P, so six. And how about in a D orbital? Yeah, there's 10. Um, obviously my answer needs to be changed here because 10 isn't even on the list. <laughs> but you could always trick them that way too. You could. Um, for our purposes in my level of class, we don't even introduce F because my students don't have to even honestly go to the D. But 
you could always add that on as well. When you purchase a lesson from me, they're fully editable uh, PowerPoint slides, so you can add that if you need to. Absolutely. And also included in all of my lessons is a digital worksheet that I mentioned earlier, powered by a company called Book Widgets. I'm able to take this entire lesson and put it into a website style delivery where students can access it super easily. You just share them a link. They can see if they're right as they're going. There's a functional whiteboard in some of them for them to draw and really do the whole model thing. Um, it, if leveraged properly, if you had to teach your codes for it, you can give assessments in there. You can see student, student performance. You can uh, analyze data, a whole slew of things. I don't really use it for that, honestly. I just like to be able to have the flexibility to give this lesson easily to a student who didn't attend class that day uh, or who's away on a family trip or who is honestly a little ahead of the rest of my class. And I can still keep them engaged and challenged while I may be having a remediation day with other students. So it provides a huge deal of flexibility. In most of my lessons, I'm also including wherever possible an exit ticket also lives there on book widgets, but to use it, all you need is the link that I provide. Of course, I do hope that you found the time you've invested in watching this video to be time well spent, that you better understand the framework of an inquiry-based lesson that doesn't have to mean your students are getting dirty, that requires no setup or cleanup from you, and a style of lesson that you can implement each and every day. One that's exciting and engaging for your students, that they feel comfortable challenge, that they never feel bored, and actually you can even tailor and differentiate the level of what you're asking them to do to where they are, whether you're teaching students who are have general learning disabilities or you're working with a a ready for college student, uh, honors level even. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. Join me next time as we look at continuation of this lesson, and that is the electron configuration lesson that pertains to the periodic trends and how we're able to, through focused practice and analysis, evidence-based analysis, get students to actually identify the key features of electron configurations that do show up as those trends on the periodic table and how there's a periodic table hack for just about everything. I look forward to seeing you back here next time.